In our first sermon on the book of Daniel, I quoted the words of a Jewish rabbi from Venice, Italy. In the early 1600s, Rabbi Simon Luzzato said to some of his Jewish students about the book of Daniel, the consequence of a too extended and profound investigation on the part of Jewish scholars would be that they would all become Christians. For it cannot be denied that according to Daniel's limitation of the time, the Messiah must have already appeared. This is exactly what happened to another Jewish rabbi in the late 1800s. Hungarian rabbi Leopold Coyne read Daniel 9.24 and concluded from the prophecy of the 70 weeks that the Messiah must have already arrived. This conclusion caused him to begin having doubts about the Jewish traditions enshrined in the Talmud, which served as much of his teaching material for his Jewish students. During one Hanukkah service, he became overwhelmed with the compulsion to share his recent wrestlings, but his listeners did not respond very well. What began as confused whispers in the congregation quickly escalated to loud shouts of angry protest. This experience crushed his spirit. He went to consult with an older rabbi. Coin later recorded the older rabbi's response. Angrily, he said, So you have set out to find the Messiah, to uncover the inscrutable. You are hardly out of the shell, and already you have the temerity to question the authority of the Talmud. The teachings of our masters are no longer good enough for you. You talk for all the world like the renegades across the sea, about whom I have recently read in a Vienna paper, who claim that our Messiah has already come. Better go back to your post, young man, and count yourself happy that you have not yet been deprived of it. And take my warning. If you persist in these unholy ideas, you will one day end your rabbinate in disgrace and probably wind up among those apostates in America. (laughs) This rebuke from the elder rabbi had the opposite of its intended effect. Rabbi Coyne now recognized that there were others who believed that the Messiah had already come and they were in America. So he traveled to New York City where he was welcomed by a Hungarian synagogue. Shortly after his arrival, he took a Sabbath afternoon stroll and happened to pass by a church with a sign written in Hebrew announcing meetings for Jews with the image of a cross on the sign. He stood transfixed. While he stood staring, one of his fellow Hungarian Jews happened to see him and his kinsman got his attention and said to him, Rabbi Coyne, better come away from this place. There are apostate Jews in that church. And they teach that the Messiah has already come. Reluctantly and quietly, Rabbi Coyne walked away. But secretly, he knew that was exactly what he was looking for. Two days later, he found the pastor of that church and told him of his wrestlings. Instead of a rebuke, he was offered a New Testament written in Hebrew. He took it home and read the opening words of the Gospel of Matthew, the book of the generation of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I'll let Rabbi Coyne tell the rest of the story. I began reading at 11 o'clock in the morning and continued until 1 o'clock after midnight. I could not understand the entire contents of the book, but I could at least see that the Messiah's name was Yeshua, that he was born in Bethlehem of Judah, that he had lived in Jerusalem and communicated with my people, and that he came just at the time predicted in the prophecy of Daniel. My joy was boundless. Leopold Coyne would later become the founder of Chosen People Ministries. Between the night of his conversion and the founding of that missions organization, focusing on bringing the the gospel to the Jewish people, Coyne would also personally experience the hostility, opposition, persecution, and tribulation depicted in the book of Daniel. But through it all, he also personally introduced over a thousand people to the Messiah who has already come, Jesus. Now, let's set the stage. We've spent the past few weeks talking about this 70 weeks prophecy. We've walked through the early part of Daniel 9, which contains Daniel's prayer, to which the angel Gabriel delivers God's answer in terms of the 70 weeks prophecy. We've looked at some necessary biblical background in the concept of the Sabbath years, and the Jubilee Proclamation of Liberty on the Day of Atonement. Last week, we looked at the stated purposes of the 70 weeks, 
Now we need to open up the rest of Gabriel's unpacking of the time frame, and we will see how the 70 weeks culminates with the Messiah's arrival, what we think of as the first coming of Jesus, particularly focusing on His death on the cross, establishing the new covenant for His people. As we do that, before we wade into what one commentator years ago described as the dismal swamp of Old Testament interpretation, strip that might reflect what you've been feeling as we've traipsed through some of the last few chapters of Daniel. Put that up there, yeah. Linus is there reflecting on the classic nursery rhyme. He says, the way I see it, the cow jumped over the moon indicates a rise in farm prices. The part about the dish running away with the spoon must refer to the consumer. Do you agree with me, Charlie Brown? To which Charlie Brown replies, I can't say. I don't pretend to be a student of prophetic literature. Well, unlike Charlie Brown, we Christians are indeed summoned to be students of prophetic literature since God has inspired so much of it in our Bibles. It is important to remember that Gabriel's message is God's answer to Daniel's prayer. The time frame indicated as 70 weeks, or more literally, 70 sevens, would have connected with Daniel's reading of his Bible. David Jeremiah has a helpful graphic displaying the significance of all of this. We start in the middle, if you can put that next slide on the screen, the uh, middle of this chart there. We recall that Daniel had read Jeremiah's prophecies, which indicated that the exile in Babylon would last 70 years. A few weeks ago, we turned to the end of 2 Chronicles, where the chronicler gave us a theological explanation for why the exile must last 70 years, and it had to do with Israel's failure to keep the law of the Sabbath year from Leviticus 25. The logic of the chronicler is that the land needed to rest the number of years that reflected the number of Sabbath years that Israel failed to observe. The 70 years represents 70 Sabbath years. And since Sabbath years occur every seven years, the 70 Sabbath years they missed would have stretched over the course of 490 years. As Dr. Jeremiah's chart indicates, Daniel's prayer focuses on the past in that Daniel was essentially asking, isn't the time for the exile up? Haven't we been in Babylon for about 70 years? Hasn't the land had its rest? Can we go home now? The answer provided by the angel Gabriel pushes Daniel's gaze into the future. If the problem that caused the exile spanned the course of a full 490 years, then it makes sense for God in His balancing justice to bring the remedy for that problem over the course of 490 years. Thus, the end of the exile, shockingly for Daniel, will not be when the Jewish people return to the land of Judah and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That's what Daniel thought Jeremiah's prophecies meant. But Gabriel is informing him that Jeremiah's prophecies only specified the beginning phase of the return from exile. Getting the Jewish people back to the land and getting the temple rebuilt was only a stage-setting act so that God could then fulfill the rest of his promises to deal with the problem that caused the exile in the first place, Jewish rebellion. But in fixing the problem of Jewish rebellion, God's design was actually to deal with human rebellion and sin, the sin of all people. Thus, the 70 weeks prophecy, as we looked at last week, is certainly for the Jews, but it is not for the Jews alone. How the 77-year periods break down is the subject of Daniel 9, 25 to 27. We zoomed in on verse 24 last week and looked closely at the six-fold solution that God was going to achieve in the midst of this period of time. Here's my summary of the message of the whole chapter with an emphasis on Gabriel's answer to Daniel's prayer. In response to Daniel's prayer... God revealed the time when He would rescue His people from the exile of sin, completely by grace, by sending the Messiah to die for them, establishing the eternal new covenant, and executing judgment against unbelieving Israel to fulfill the ultimate jubilee. Let's read Daniel 9, 24 to 27, 
We looked closely at verse 24 last week, but we need to remember that verse as a summary heading for the rest of the passage. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. I suggested last week that the sixfold solution, the six goals for the 70 weeks, would not be accomplished gradually throughout the 490 year period of time. Rather, the way the prophecy is introduced, and as we'll see today, the way the rest of the passage unfolds makes it likely that these goals will be accomplished climactically in the 70th week. My reading of this passage recognizes a certain structure that certainly impacts the way I understand the details. This chart on the next slide lays out that structure. It might be a bit hard for you to see from where you're sitting. But essentially, each verse has two halves, two sections, marked by the repetition of a particular word in Hebrew. It is common in the Bible for a story to be told this way or an argument to be made like this rather than um, addressing topic A from start to finish and then moving on to address topic B. When a writer wants to talk about two related but distinct topics, they will often introduce topic A and then introduce topic B and then return to topic A and then return to topic B and then elaborate more on topic A and then go back to topic B in order to show more clearly the connection between the two topics. We in the modern West probably wouldn't do it that way, but that's very common in the Bible. The words in this chart reflect my own very literal translation of the Hebrew. I rarely offer my own translation as an alternative to what you have in your own Bibles, and this is not intended to replace that in any way. However, by presenting this to you, I can more easily show you some of the pivotal things that stand out in how I understand this passage. The reference to sevens, or weeks, throughout the passage are all in the left column, and they are all connected to the anointed one and his work. The word decreed is the key word in the right-hand column, and those statements all have to do with the city of Jerusalem and the temple. In verse 25, you won't see the word decreed, but in Hebrew, the word translated trench or moat is from the same root as decreed, and a Hebrew reader can catch the connection. So with this structure, if you're familiar with this passage, you can probably already see some of where I'm headed. Another way of viewing this structure is as a chiasm or a chiasm, where you have this parallel structure that moves into a midpoint That is very, very common in the book of Daniel and also throughout the scriptures. When you see it like this, outlined there on the screen, you can see there's this alternation between the construction of Jerusalem at the beginning and then the coming of an anointed one. And then back to the construction of Jerusalem. And then the heart of the passage, the center point, the main point, the feature, the focus, the emphasis is on the death of the anointed one right in the center. And then he moves out from that center in verse 26 to the destruction of Jerusalem and then back to the activities of the anointed one, and then finally back around to the destruction of, the Jeru- of Jerusalem. Now, one issue I didn't bring up last week is whether or not we should take this 70 weeks of years as a literal span of time. It may surprise you, but I believe 
we should take this as a literal 490-year period of time. Now, as we observed last week, in one sense, this is not taking Gabriel's words literally. He refers to 77s, and we interpret that figure of speech as referring to 77-year periods. But because of the breakdown in verse 25, I believe he intends a real historical span of time. And Gabriel focuses our attention on certain historical events within this time frame. So let's begin looking at the details. In verse 25, Gabriel gives us a starting point and an end point. Verse 25 says in the ESV, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So, the start date or starting event is the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. Four options are commonly suggested for this word with four very different dates. You can see the four options there on the screen. Accepting the first one, Cyrus's decree as the one Gabriel refers to usually means that an interpreter is taking the 70 weeks as a symbolic period of time, not actually referring to 490 years of history. Some conservative, Bible-believing Students of Scripture do take this approach, and I have held this view in the past. Gabriel's description of the word as having to do with restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem makes Cyrus' decree very attractive, especially when it is remembered that Isaiah the prophet had repeatedly spoken of Cyrus by name as the one Yahweh would use to restore the people to the land and allow the people to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and enable them to rebuild the temple. The record of the decree in Ezra and Second Chronicles focused on the rebuilding of the temple. But Isaiah's prophecies emphasized the return to the land and the rebuilding of the city, like Daniel or Gabriel. Nevertheless, since I now see good reason to take the 77-year periods as a literal 490-year period of history, I can't accept option number one. Option number two, Darius's decree simply reiterates Cyrus's decree. After the Jewish people quit working on the temple because of some opposition they faced, the Persian king intervened on behalf of the Jews after finding the archive records of Cyrus's decree. With the king's decree and the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah, the Lord got the people back to work. Read all about it in the book of Ezra. Very few interpreters look to this decree in connection with Gabriel's words, mostly because the time frame becomes really out of whack. Option number three is similar to option number two, in that it is a reiteration of Cyrus' decree, this time allowing Ezra to lead more Jewish people back to the land to, as Ezra puts it, beautify the house of Yahweh that is in Jerusalem. But in the conclusion of that decree... King Artaxerxes granted Ezra permission to appoint magistrates and judges, which could be viewed as the final need for a functioning city, for a restored and rebuilt Jerusalem. The need for civil servants who would enforce law and order puts the crowning achievement on the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem. I believe this decree to be what Gabriel has in mind. A very odd detail in the book of Ezra adds support to this one to be viewed as the final decree having to do with the rebuilding of Jerusalem. In Ezra 6.14, before we actually read about this decree in chapter 7 of Ezra, we read these summarizing words from the Spirit-inspired author of the book. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. In chapter 6 of Ezra, the story is progressing during the reign of Darius. And this summary statement has to do with the completion of the temple, which historically occurred in 515 B.C., way before Artaxerxes was even king. But the author of the book of Ezra views the decree for rebuilding the temple and the city as one 
unified decree connected to the three Persian kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. And he puts that singular decree underneath the heading of the decree of the true sovereign, Yahweh, the God of Israel. So, I am currently inclined to view this as the starting point of the 70 weeks period. Option number four, if we can go back to those four options there, is favored by folks like Dr. Jeremiah and John MacArthur. The same Persian king we meet in Ezra chapter 7 provides another letter per granting permission to Nehemiah to take people and resources to Jerusalem in order to build the wall of the city. The primary reason I am not convinced that we should view this as the starting point of the 70 weeks is because Nehemiah's rebuilding is disconnected with the rebuilding anticipated by Daniel. By 445 B.C., when this decree is put forth, or this letter is given as permission, the city has been rebuilt and fully functional for many years, at least seven years by that point. What prompts Nehemiah to request this permission was a report he had received that there had been some vandalism, some fresh destruction against the recently rebuilt, rebuilt walls of the city. Nehemiah is not grieving that the walls of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by Babylon and had never been rebuilt. Rather, those rebuilt walls had been attacked and recently damaged, and Nehemiah desires to repair what has since been destroyed. That leads me away from considering what happens in Nehemiah 2 as a valid option for the starting point for Gabriel's word about the rebuilding of the city. So, if option number three is the starting point, 458 B.C., what's the end point? Messiah. The ESV and most of our versions insert the phrase, the coming of. But literally, it's just until Messiah. Gabriel doesn't pinpoint any particular event in the Messiah's life. And I think that's because we shouldn't be expecting to pinpoint the time frame exactly. Rather, Gabriel has provided a window of time. The start date we can pinpoint because a decree happens on a particular day. But the end point is a person, Messiah. After noting the starting point and the end point, we get the time frame in view here is not the full 70 weeks. Rather, he mentions seven weeks and 62 weeks. There's disagreement even in our Bible translations on whether or not the seven weeks and 62 weeks should be viewed together or separately. I believe they do go together, as you can see in the New American Standard Bible. However, Gabriel doesn't just say 69 weeks. So there is some significance to the seven weeks standing alone. And I think the significance is just this. The first 49 years, seven weeks of years, are the period of time related to the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. From Artaxerxes' decree in 458 B.C., 49 years takes us to the year 409 or 408 B.C. There is some historical evidence outside the Bible that this year was the final year of Nehemiah's final term of serving as governor of Judah. But in any case, the Lord works through Nehemiah to bring final stability to the Jews who returned home and to the city of Jerusalem especially. What of the 62 weeks then, the 434 years on top of that? Well, that is what the rest of verse 25 is about. Jerusalem remains rebuilt, but the time period is filled with trouble and distress for the Jewish people. The period of time will feature in Daniel chapter 11, where we'll see the warfare within the Greek kingdom and on into the Roman Empire that made living in Israel in those days, such a terrifying experience, much like it is today. But once the seven and 62 weeks of years end, the Jews should be expecting to see the Messiah in the 70th week. Verses 26 and 27 are both providing the details of the climactic 70th week, the final week of years that would see the fulfillment of the sixfold solution laid out in verse 24. Verse 26 specifies the death of the Messiah and the destruction of the city. And after the 62 weeks, 
An anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Many students of Scripture view the phrase after the 62 weeks indicating a gap before the introduction of the 70th week. The final week will be mentioned explicitly in verse 27. As, so some see verse 26 as describing events that will take place in a gap between the 69th week and the 70th. I think it is far more likely that after the 62 weeks is simply another way of referring, of saying during the 70th week. Moreover, if this is describing the death of the Messiah, which most would agree is the event that guarantees the fulfillment of the sixfold solution of verse 24, I have a very hard time believing that the most important event in all of prophetic history occurs outside the time frame of the, 70th, of the 70 weeks laid out by Gabriel. The key event of all history is supposed to occur in a kind of parenthetical break in the outworking of God's prophetic purposes. I just can't believe that. The King James Version probably has a better translation of the second part of the first sentence there. It reads, Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. By this ambiguous Hebrew phrase, Gabriel indicates that the Messiah will be executed as a criminal, but not because of crimes he himself committed. Rather, his death will be substitutionary to pay for the crimes of others. That is the linchpin of all of history. That is the most important event of all of history. That is the guarantee and the cause of all of those wondrous goals of the 70 weeks listed in verse 24. And verse 24 certainly set us up to expect that this history-altering event would occur not in the 69th week, not in some unreckoned time, as it's sometimes called, but in the climactic 70th week. So much of the calendar calculating work that is done in connection with this passage, I believe, messes up right here. If you take option number four as the starting point, and you add 483 years to get to the 69th week of years, everyone knows that you don't get a possible date for the ministry and death of Jesus. One early church writer known to us as Julius Africanus seems to have been the first to introduce the idea that the Jews counted years differently than other cultures. He said that 483 years counted in the Greek way equals 475 years counted in the Jewish way. That idea doesn't seem to have been real convincing to his contemporaries in the 200s. But a similar idea came around in the late 1800s. Rather famously now, a fellow by the name of Sir Robert Anderson wrote a book about this passage entitled The Coming Prince. He introduced the idea of prophetic years, whereby he suggested Jews calculated their years in terms of 30-day months, totaling up for 360-day years, instead of the solar calculated 365-day 365-day years. He based this, first of all, on a common observation from the book of Genesis. The global flood of judgment is stated to have lasted 150 days in Genesis 7.24 and 8.3. And it is said to have lasted from the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month. Five months. Dr. Jeremiah calls this conclusive evidence to show that the prophetic year consisted of not of 365 days, but of 360 days. And he sees this as proving that the earliest known month in Bible history was 30 days in length. And 12 months of such length would be a period of 360 days, or a 360-day year. There is a term for that line of argumentation. The Latin phrase, non sequitur. It simply means not sequential. In other words, the conclusion being drawn from the biblical data simply does not follow. 
May I appeal to reason for just a moment? To say a period of five months that is said to equal 150 days must imply that each month lasted 30 days is easily disprovable. Do the math. Count the days from February 17th of this year to July 17th of this year. Do those five months all have 30 days? No. I'm drawing this to your attention to challenge your thinking and to help you think through what you hear and what you read. I'm not wanting you to lose respect or trust for authors who think this way or argue this way, like Dr. Jeremiah or John MacArthur or others. I respect and learn from these men too. But all of us have blind spots. All of us can make mistakes. And all of us can do poor research at times. That's why we need each other to point these things out, to ask these kinds of questions. I stumbled onto Max Licato preaching this text last year on YouTube. He also appealed to Sir Robert Anderson, and he said that the calculations from Anderson have never been refuted. David Jeremiah similarly wrote a few years ago, the exact nature of Anderson's computation has stood the test for over a century and has been corroborated by many biblical scholars. I honestly don't know how these men can say this. I'm genuinely flabbergasted at this point. The fact is that Anderson's computations were rigorously challenged pretty soon after they were published and gained steam originally in 1895. And much more recently, in the 1970s, a professor from Dallas Seminary who agrees that option four is the starting date who agrees that there is a gap between the 69th and 70th week and agrees that a 360-day prophetic year is a thing that should influence the way we interpret Scripture, showed conclusively several errors in Anderson's computations. Recognizing the clarity with which this prophecy speaks of the death of Jesus, and it does, people want to make the dates line up just so. However, even the date of Jesus' crucifixion is not absolutely certain. The best argumentation that accounts for all the biblical and historical and even astronomical data that we have today seems to suggest the year 33 A.D. But these dating schemes that attempt to mark the arrival of the Messiah in verse 25 of Daniel 9 on the precise day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as part of the 69th week are all still too early. And that pushes some folks to ignore some data to conclude that Jesus must have died in the year 30 or 31 or even 32. The desire to make this prophecy line up with precise dates can push us into being careless with the data. I do not believe it is appropriate or historically justified to introduce a 360-day year into the interpretation of Scripture. I do not believe that we can or should disconnect this prophecy from real-life history and real-life dating. No one, not the Jews, not any other culture on the face of the planet, as far as we know, ever actually followed a calendar that has 360 days consistently. In fact, ancient cultures didn't make calendars the way that we think of calendars. Instead, they simply followed the movements of the sun, moon, and stars. Cultures experimented with different calendar systems to plan events and track their history. But they constantly made adjustments to account for the real movements they observed in the sky. So for me, I do not see a need to introduce a less than normal year into our understanding of Scripture at this point. And... Under a normal reckoning of the years, starting with 458 B.C., means that the 70th week would begin in the middle of the year 26 A.D., which would place all of Jesus' ministry and His death on the cross within the climactic 70th week, counting literally normal years. Let's continue looking at the text. To pile on the controversy, 
we have to consider the people of the prince who is to come. This is the phrase Sir Robert Anderson used to title his book, The Coming Prince. And for him, that is a reference to the Antichrist who will come in the future. I remain uncertain about the identity of the prince of verse 26. I have bounced between three options. One, a Jewish zealot known as John of Giscala, who elevated himself as ruler of the Jews in Jerusalem and transformed the temple into a military fortress and escalated the Jewish revolt between 67 and 70 AD that resulted in the destruction of the temple, a man I believe to be depicted in Daniel chapter 11. Second, the Roman general Titus, who led the Roman armies into Jerusalem to destroy the temple in 70 AD. Or number three, Jesus, the Messiah, whom I still see to be the most natural understanding from the grammar of the passage. In verse 25, we see an anointed one, a prince, or Messiah, a ruler or leader. The word translated prince is a word that refers to someone who has been put out in front of others, a leader. In the Old Testament, it often is used to refer to Israel's kings, and often in connection with anointing specifically. It is featured, this word is featured in the promise of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. It's used only one time in the Old Testament, clearly referring to a pagan king. But in Daniel 9, 26, we see the people of a leader destroying Jerusalem and the temple. For some, this makes identifying this leader as Jesus just too difficult. But the word translated who is to come is actually an important messianic term in the Old Testament, in one, other in one other passage in particular. The words sung in praise of Jesus as He entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey are taken from Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is He who comes in the name of Yahweh. He who comes is the exact same form we have attached to the word translated leader in Daniel 9, 26. Both of these words have clear messianic connections in the Old Testament. It's very difficult for me, therefore, to see any other reference here in Daniel 9 than to the coming King, Jesus. I can see no strong reason, either grammatically or contextually, in Daniel 9 to view this as anyone other than Jesus. And that makes what Gabriel says so shocking. It is the Messiah's people who will destroy the city and the temple. The temple will remain standing, rebuilt, as Gabriel said in verse 25, all the way through the end of the 69th week. But at some point later, perhaps even beyond the scope of the 70 weeks, the people of the Messiah, who will have already come and accomplished His work, ironically, shockingly, will be guilty of causing the destruction of the city and the temple again. This is the bad news side of Gabriel's announcement. Daniel is focused on hopes for the return of the Jews to the land and the rebuilding of the temple. And all that will happen. But Daniel is also hoping that the Jewish rebellion will end. And that will happen too, in part. Many Jews will turn away from their sin and to their Messiah. But many will not. And those who do not will continue in their rebellion in such a way that will cause the city to be laid waste and the temple to be destroyed again. This will come to pass in 70 A.D. Outside the scope of the 70 weeks in one sense, the city's end will be preceded by a flood of Roman soldiers and about three and a half years of warfare between zealous Jews and Romans. And the Jews will lose. Notice that the coming prince, the leader who is to come, is not the one who brings destruction in this verse. It's the people. A term in Daniel that almost always refers specifically to the Jewish people. It's important to remember that the actions of a king's subjects are not necessarily endorsed by the king. Now let's turn to verse 27 where Gabriel returns to talking about the Messiah's work in the 70th week. 
the making of a covenant, the ending of sacrifice, and the defeat of the desolator. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Who puts in force this covenant? If we're reading straight through and not recognizing how Gabriel goes back and forth between topics, we'd assume that it is the coming prince, the leader who is to come from the second half of verse 26. And that could be possible. And in my view, that still means it's Jesus who puts in force this covenant. But going back to that alternating structure of Gabriel's words, the he who puts in force the covenant is the anointed one who was cut off in the first half of verse 26. And it is the cutting off of the anointed one that establishes this covenant. Daniel had been praying about the broken covenant between Yahweh and the people. And the other prophets announced the coming of a new covenant as the fulfillment of all the previous covenants between God and His people. I believe this passage fits well with those other passages. Who is the covenant with? Literally, the many. The many. This little phrase would have probably brought to Daniel's mind Isaiah 53, the song about the suffering servant. The cutting off of the Messiah in verse 26 is the death of the suffering servant. Isaiah's song actually begins in Isaiah 52, 13. In 52, 14, he indicates that many would be astonished at this servant because his appearance would become so marred. In 52, 15, he indicates that the servant would sprinkle many nations. Then in Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, the climactic conclusion of the song, we read these glorious words. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Jesus pulls all this together in the Last Supper. In Matthew 26, 28, we read, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. A fellow by the name of Philip Morrow, writing in 1923, summarized the point well. In these words, we find four things which agree with the 70 weeks prophecy. First, the one who was to confirm the covenant, Christ. Second, the covenant itself. Third, that which confirmed the covenant, the blood of Christ. Fourth, those who received the benefits of the covenant, the many. The identification is complete, for the words correspond perfectly with those of the prophecy. He shall confirm the covenant with many. Thus, the covenant Gabriel speaks of is the new covenant, prophesied elsewhere by Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel most plainly. Allow me to quote, quote Philip Morrow once more at length on the importance of the many as a biblically recognizable phrase. It is further to be noted that although the promise of the new covenant was made to the entire house of Israel and house of Judah, according to Jeremiah 31, 31, not all of them entered into its benefits. Those who rejected Christ were as branches broken off, Romans eleven seventeen. We see then the accuracy of Scripture in the words of the prophecy, with many, and those of the Lord Jesus, shed for many. This use of the word many is found in other like Scriptures. Thus, in a similar prophecy, it is written, My righteous servant shall justify many, Isaiah 53, 11. Again, and many of the children of Israel shall, John the baptizer, turn to their Lord their God, Luke 1, 11. This was said by the same heavenly messenger, Gabriel, when he announced to Zacharias the birth of his son. And yet again, this time from the lips of Simeon, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, Luke 
And yet once more, in the words of the Lord Jesus, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. In each of these scriptures, the word many applies to those who receive by faith the benefits of the new covenant, which Christ made sure by the shedding of his blood upon the cross. Thus, I see no evidence for believing that the Bible teaches that Antichrist will make some kind of peace treaty with the nation of Israel in the end times. This is the only verse used to build that doctrine, and I believe it is without warrant. I believe verse 27 begins by indicating the cutting off of the Messiah. His sacrificial death, stated in verse 26, is also to be viewed as the establishing of the new covenant, which other passages tell us is an eternal covenant. Certainly the new covenant isn't to last only for one week or one seven-year period. The problem is that the word for in the phrase for one week is not reflected in Hebrew. The grammatical construction could imply a duration, uh, but normally a preposition is included to make that clear. Here, the plainest way to take the Hebrew is as, and he will enact a covenant with the many during the one week. Likewise, we tend to overread the next phrase, and for half of the week. Again, there's no four in the text. The word translated half, when it's attached to a time span, like week, can just mean in the midst of, without intending to specify the precise midpoint. Look to Psalm 102, 24, or Jeremiah 17, 11, if you want an example where you'll find the phrase in the midst of, reflecting this exact same construction. Thus, what happens in the midst of the final week? He, the Messiah, shall put an end to the, to the offering of sacrifices. Now that the suffering servant has provided the once-for-all sacrifice to end all sacrifices, so that forgiveness of sins may be offered to all who believe, the author of Hebrews can say in Hebrews 10, 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And the context of that verse in Hebrews 10 has the author drawing implications from the new covenant having been established in Jesus' death. God has not accepted a single animal sacrifice as payment for sin since the day Jesus died on the cross, and he never will again. The popular interpretation of verse 27 pushes folks to suggest that Daniel's 70th week is equivalent to the tribulation. Then, the identification of the coming prince as the Antichrist at the end of history pushes folks to see the Antichrist making some kind of seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Then, at the halfway point of the week, after three and a half years, the Antichrist will break this treaty and cause the sacrifices to stop being offered at the temple, and the final three and a half years are called the Great Tribulation, where the suffering and persecution of the Jews is escalated by the Antichrist and his forces. This then pushes folks to assume that the temple must be rebuilt again in Jerusalem before the tribulation can begin. All of this is based on Daniel 9, 26 and 27, and only on Daniel 9, 26 and 27. So, to be as clear as I can, let me state what I do not believe this passage or the Bible anywhere teaches. And I hope all of us recognize that everything I'm about to say, these marginal, external, non-central doctrinal issues, okay? I do not believe the Bible teaches that there will be a period of tribulation that will last exactly seven years. I do not believe the Bible teaches definitively that the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, ever. I do not believe the Bible teaches that the final Antichrist will establish peace in the Middle East for Israel. And it follows that I do not believe that the Antichrist will betray the Jewish people in some specific way that will result in their increased persecution. Now, I'm sure that raises lots of questions for you perhaps, and I hope you'll ask me some of them sometime. 
But let's close out the passage for today. The last sentence of verse 27, everyone agrees, is very difficult to translate and to interpret. I believe it's likely describing the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred in 70 AD. It was the Roman armies under the leadership of General Titus who slaughtered many, laid waste to the city, and flattened the temple once again. However, even the Jewish historian Josephus affirmed that the blame for this destruction falls squarely on the shoulders of the Jewish people. While Josephus looks to the historical causes, the Jewish zealots' violent refusal to cooperate any longer with Roman occupation and policies, we can see the ultimate theological reason. God used the Roman armies, as he had used the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Greeks, to bring judgment against the Jewish people, this time for murdering their Messiah. Moreover, the language of abominations causing desolation, the desolation of Jerusalem and the temple, echoes the prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 8, God showed Ezekiel the idolatry of the Jewish leaders going on in the temple, and the Lord referred to it as abominations that would drive Yahweh to abandon His temple sanctuary. Now, as we can conclude, let's consider Jesus' usage of this passage. It is curious that no New Testament author ever refers specifically to the 70 weeks of Daniel or the 70th week. That would have been helpful for us. But there are other ways this passage seems to feature in the New Testament. The fact that the time frame is not mentioned directly suggests that it's the events featured in the passage that are more important than the calculations. Jesus seems to draw on this passage in his teaching on the Mount of Olives just a few days before his death. For example, in Luke 21, 20, Jesus says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. That's probably an indication that Jesus saw Daniel 9, 27 as referring to the impending destruction of the temple, which would take place in 70 AD. Moreover, this qualifies something we noted a few weeks ago. When we see the connection between the 70 weeks and the fulfillment of the ultimate jubilee, as prophesied in Isaiah 61, and in Luke 4, we heard Jesus quote those words from Isaiah 61 in the synagogue in Nazareth, we made the point that he stopped short of referring to the day of vengeance, which ultimately points forward to his second coming to bring final judgment against those who remain in rebellion against him. But here in Luke 21, as he warns his disciples of the coming judgment of Jerusalem, he adds in verse 22, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So, as was the day of Babylon's destruction of Solomon's temple, so would be the day of Rome's destruction of Herod's temple, and so will be the return of Jesus, leading His armies against all unbelievers. These are all days when God executes His judgment, His vengeance against those in rebellion against Him. During the same teaching, as recorded in Matthew 24, Jesus also seems to refer specifically to Daniel 9, 27. In Matthew 24, 15, we read, So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus is instructing His disciples, some of whom would still be alive in 70 A.D., and he points back to this passage in Daniel 9, and I believe he and Daniel both are referring to the events that would unfold in 70 A.D. The destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple are not, strictly speaking, to be viewed as part of the 70 weeks period of time. This judgment wasn't listed as part of the sixfold solution, the six goals of the 70 weeks period, which Gabriel outlined in Daniel 9.24. However, the judgment of Jerusalem and the temple is to be understood as a direct result of the Jewish leadership's murder of the Messiah. Ironically, the very event that achieves their redemption, their salvation, includes their own hard-hearted rejection of that redemption.
Nevertheless, as thousands of Jews, including some of the Jewish leaders, came to trust Jesus as their Messiah, the purposes of the 70 weeks began to have their fulfillment. The final jubilee had come. The ultimate day of atonement sacrifice had been offered. And now freedom from slavery to sin, Satan, and death was available to all, both Jews and Gentiles, those who reject the jubilee proclamation, the preaching of the gospel, remain under the judgment of God, both Jews and Gentiles. But the eternal new covenant has been enacted in the death of Jesus. And so forgiveness of sin can be offered to Jew and Gentile alike. Since the final week of the 70 weeks period involves the fulfillment of the ultimate jubilee, we might need to understand the final week as not being limited to a literal seven-year period. Rather, we might need to view that final climactic 70th week as an eternal week so that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD did indeed occur in the 70th week, and the 70th week will continue until... Jesus returns to execute final judgment and to rescue and resurrect all those who are waiting for Him, both in heaven and on earth. Would you pray with me? Father, there are difficult passages in Scripture, and this is among the most difficult. We have wrestled with it for the last few weeks in this building and in this setting And we pray that we have honored you in the way that we have handled the text, the questions that we've raised, and the ways that we've challenged our own thinking and our own understanding. We pray that you would be pleased with our wrestlings. You call us to love you with all our mind. And it's texts like these that draw us up into that task. And so we pray, Father, that you would help us to understand what you have for us in the scriptures and help us to make the main thing the main thing and to keep our focus and our attention riveted on Jesus and his work. It is attested to and pointed to throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and we should be reading our Bibles in view of Jesus. And so help us to do that well. Help us to ask those kinds of questions when we come to texts like these. But Father, most of all, we pray that you would help us to trust the Messiah who has already come. We pray that our proclamation would be centered on him and we would not be distracted by other concerns, whether they be focused on end time speculation, identity of a coming antichrist figure, or the turmoil in the Middle East. We, your people, are to keep our eyes looking up, waiting for the return of our Savior. That is what we look forward to. That is where our attention must be focused. So would you help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and let us long for his return and be busy about the calling that he's laid on all of us to be a testimony and to witness of the work that's already been done, the enactment of the new covenant, the solving of the sin problem, the fulfillment of prophecy. Thank you for giving us clarity on that, if nothing else. Help us to honor you with the the way we talk about Jesus. We want to speak well of him and speak well of you in our conversations and in our relationships. And so would you move us in that direction constantly. We commit our time and our energies to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.